Thank you. Uh, so, Rushad, uh, it's quite uh, nice of you to put up a course uh, like this thing and consider us for uh, uh, these things. Uh, whenever we have a dry course, I always wonder that uh, would there be any audience, would there be anybody who would be interested in such dry topic? But mind you, um, though the topic is very dry, but this is something which is bread and butter of not only just ophthalmologists, but those company outside also. They survive on these lubricants, right? So remember, we are very important and very relevant when we talk about this thing. So my job today is to talk to you about selecting lubricant drop. And first question arises, why care about that? Why do we need to worry about it? I mean, just put lubricant drops and that's it. The problem is that whatever we do, Whenever we classify dry eye, whether it's aqueous deficient dry eye, evaporative dry eye, we are classifying dry eye based on the effect of the problem and not the root cause, right? Finally, what happens? You have abnormal tear film stability, but that's effect. That's not the root cause. Whether the tear film secretion is less, that's effect. That's not the root cause. Even the treatment. We give multiple lubricants, different, different lubricants, and every day person comes with, same company will come with three people who will talk about my lubricant, my lubricant. Uh, are we actually treating the root cause? We are not treating the root cause. We are treating the effect again. So how do we expect all these gamut, what we have for us, that it will take care of all our problem? Well, because we are not treating the root cause. We need to understand the pathogenesis of the problem and then only we can take care of that. So all the dry eye are not same, we know that. How can a dry eye with rheumatoid arthritis be same as dry eye with MGD and still will give same lubricant drop and expect everything to be fine? Well, that does not happen. So we must understand that we need to investigate for the root cause of the problem. Now, before we go into those kind of uh, things, let's understand that when we talk about lubricants, my job today is just to talk about lubricant. When we talk about lubricants, we talk about ideal lubricant, but we know none exist because a lubricant is not an artificial tear. A lot of time we mispronounce uh, this thing as artificial tear. There's no artificial tear. You cannot make a bloody tear. Forget about anything else because it's such a biologically active thing which cannot be replicated by us. So, well, there is no ideal lubricant exists. So whenever, whatever we have, let's dissect out in few components. So when we talk about lubricant, we have few components like preservative, electrolyte, viscose, elastic agent, and the osmolarity part. Uh, remember one thing, irrespective of whatever it may be, not all the eyes are same. Whenever you give something to one patient, if he or she is happy, when you give it to another patient, he or she may not be happy. And you convey this thing to your patient also that, you know what, when you are not happy with the drop, rather than changing the doctor, we'll change the drop, right? If we understand this thing, and if patients understand this thing, possibly that half of the problem will be solved. So let's start with the first and foremost preservative. We like to hate these guys, preservatives. And there are preservatives which are bad like benzalkonium chloride, which we just don't like. And there are some preservatives which are a little gentle, which we still like, like those stabilized oxychloro compound or sodium perborate and those kind of thing. So let's talk about our main villain, which is benzalkonium chloride. And we love to hate this thing. And all the company will come and talk to you about that it's so bad. I agree, it's really bad. It's epithelial toxic and it's been studied uh, quite widely and I'm not debating here. But remember one thing, when we give drop four to six times in a day, the amount of this benzalkonium chloride which you're delivering to surface is not very huge. Also look at the dilution. When we put a drop after 30 seconds, the benzalkonium chloride gets diluted by eight folds and by three minutes, it's diluted by 36 folds. It's a very meager amount which is going to be on surface. So if ocular surface is healthy, you're putting drop four to six times. Uh, is it as bad? Well, I won't call it as bad. So we do, though we love to hate that, it's not as bad as we thought. But yes, certainly, I wouldn't like in my ideal lubricant anything which is toxic. So when we talk about little safer uh, preservatives like uh, stabilized oxychloro compound, 
they are preservatives still. Remember, they are themselves also surface toxic, but they convert into something which is relatively safer for the surface. This conversion happens because of a couple of things. Like some of them, they convert related to the ultraviolet exposure. So when person is exposed outside light or natural light, they get converted into safer compounds. But if person is inbound, they are not exposed to outside light, do you think all the entire molecule will get converted? Possibly not. So if you think that all these safer preservatives are preservative free, they are not. They themselves also can lead to some kind of epithelial toxicity. The only preservative free are unims, which we do not like and most of the company introduce and they disappear because Indian market somehow is not mature to use unims. Other preservative free are ointments. They can be preservative free. So we wish that in our ideal lubricants there should not be any preservatives uh, but if they are there and if we are using if the surface is stable don't worry about it too much they, they're fine they, they're going to be fine. Next thing is electrolytes well there are multiple electrolytes which are there in natural tears and in artificial tears also we put multiple of them one of them is sodium which is mainstay of osmolarity of the drop so when you when you want to create a lubricant, you would like to keep it on little bit of alkaline side. And this is done by all these electrolytes. So sodium decides about uh, the osmolarity and which helps you to keep your lubricant iso-osmolar. Potassium helps in the maintenance of goblet cell. And bicarbonate is supposedly helping us in preservating the, uh, the tearful epithelium, uh, uh, the surface epithelium. However, Whenever we are using devices which are reusable drops, when we open it and close it, like most of our drops, bicarbonate is unstable compound. It's going to get evaporated through carbon dioxide and it's not going to be there. So is it as effective as we say? Well, we don't know. Another thing about the sodium part. Now, sodium is important to maintain the osmolarity. But you know what? When you combine with our lubricants, when we talk about, say, carbomer, when we combine sodium with carbomer, actually the carbomer effectiveness comes down. So addition of isotonic saline with carbomer actually leads to significantly reduced viscosity of carbomer. Right? So again, when we want to make an ideal lubricant, we want everything together, but unfortunately adding everything together is not going to reflect into better, better product. Next comes the viscosity agent. Now these are the agents which we love and this is just mere one part of the lubricant. But your entire industry thrives on this thing. They come, sir, we have CMC drop, sir, we have HPMC drop. That's viscoelastic agent only. That's one part of the lubricant and it's not the entire lubricant, right? So, but we still love them. Why? Well, it gives longevity to the, to the drop. It gives viscosity. It allows it to stay a little longer on the surface. But if you make the drop too much viscous, it will possibly stay on the surface and would lead to little blurring. It would also lead to crusting on your lid margin and eyelashes and patient may not be happy. So every patient who walks in, if you say I'll give you very viscous drop, they may not be happy because it's not required for that person. Higher the molecular weight, more is the viscosity. Lower the molecular weight, less is the viscosity. So there are multiple viscoelastic agents which we uh, deal with uh, and uh, from, uh, from our market point of view, when CMC has come under price control, suddenly we start seeing that all the companies are pushing for polyols, all these PVAs, uh, polyethylene glycols and suddenly every company has those things and they are priced much higher. But interestingly, polyols do not have viscosity themselves unless they are combined with an, another agent which is like HP Guar. Now HP Guar is something which gives the viscosity to polyols. So if you do not have viscosity agent uh, combining with such kind of molecule, it's not going to be very viscous. So just because something has come under price control, the profit margin goes down, the company now wants to push something else, which is possibly not the best thing which you want. Also, remember one more concept of something called ocular surface resident time. So that means when you put a drop on somebody's eye, how long it's going to stay on that person's eye. This holds true for everything, not just for lubricant. 
for antibiotics, for every eye drop which you put, you must know the ocular surface resident time of the drop. It depends on many things. It depends upon viscosity, blink rate, tear film turnover, temperature, pH of the surface, how the molecule absorbs or adsorbs to the surface and the evaporation rate. So many properties which should decide how long the drop will stay on the surface. There are methods uh, which can allow us to check uh, the ocular surface resident time, direct, indirect method. But let's not worry about this thing. But I would uh, run you through a short, small little gist of a study which actually studied one of the most viscous molecule which we normally quote sodium hyaluronate, right? And all of us are told that sodium hyaluronate is most viscous. And they found in the study that the half-life, so we cannot talk about the entire molecule, how long it's going to last. So that's why we always, drug or anything, we always talk about half-life. The half-life of uh, this molecule, sodium hyaluronate, was as low as 5.5 minutes, right? And if I give a little more advantage to it, say full life is 15 minutes, cannot be, right? So even if I give that, you think about when you give a drop to patient and tell them to put four times in a day. That's homeopathic dose. It's not going to work, right? And somehow, as an ophthalmologist, we have habit of that four times a day. I don't know from where we learn, but lubricants, we always give four times a day. It's just psychological. It's for you psychological as well as for patient psychological. You have to give them more frequently. It does not help. And look at the other agents like HPMC, PVA, 44 seconds. And if you give four times a day, patient sleeps for eight hours. I mean, really nice person sleeps for eight hours and awake for 16 hours. In which 44 seconds, 44 seconds, 44 seconds, 44 seconds. And you expect every miracle that everything will be nice and does not happen. That's because we are also at fault. We give them drop a little less. And interestingly, industry does not understand this thing. If they percolate this concept in our brain that doctor, four times is very less, you have to give longer. Instead of that, they come and tell, doctor, this is more viscous, now only two times. Come on. I'm crazy. That's, that's, that's something as crazy as they can get. So any lubricant four times a day, please remember, it's not going to do anything. You have to give them more frequently. Again, talking about ocular surface, resident time and temperature. Temperature reduces viscosity and with reduced uh, viscosity, ocular surface resident time reduces. So with the country like us where the temperature can be quite high, again the frequency has to be higher. And some of the medications like say hypermellose, carmelose and all those things, at normal temperature also they do not have enough uh, viscosity. At normal pH also they do not have enough viscosity. So if you keep on using them, it's not going to help us because it's not going to stay longer on the surface. So you can certainly tell patient that, well, if you're using these drops, you can refrigerate it. There's no harm in that, right? But we tell them about fortified medication, uh, but we never tell about lubricants. So why lubricants? Lubricants you buy one more. It's still not going to work. Role of pH. Now, pH changes also leads to change in the rheological property or viscosity of the drop. Most of the time, and one interesting molecule there again is HP Guar. Now, HP Guar, as I told you, with certain uh, drop, which is very important part of uh, their drop, and they said it lasts indefinitely. Our drop, uh, the HP Guar is viscous only at alkaline pH. It's actually liquid form when it's 7 pH, 7.5 it turns little gel form. But there are certain medication actually, so well I don't like to take names but uh, well for our common understanding I would say sustain ultra but there are many other drops which are similar. So when you combine medications like these kind of things, so many medications have acidic pH. So when you combine medications, you say cyclopentol, tropicamide, ofloxacin, lid patching, all these things lead to acidic pH. Your drop which you think is going to work as a lubricant is not going to work here. It's not meant to work at this pH, right? So remember that uh, combining multiple medications does not always help. There's some interesting fact about these lubricants. PVA is not very compatible with electrolytes like sodium borate, sodium sulfate, and all those things. 
CMC gets crusted and it forms insoluble precipitates, especially higher molecular weight, 1% in certain individuals, depending upon the pH and then electrolytes, and especially when it's uh, combined with uh, certain electrolytes. The next part uh, is the hyperosmolarity. Well, we know the hyperosmolarity. Uh, Rishad, you can stop me anytime if uh, I run out, run out of time. Then, okay, so the hyperosmolarity is something which is very important, and uh, there are plenty of studies about that. And they tell us then when the TFM becomes hyperosmolar, it drains out the water from inside, and it leads to epithelial dehydration. When epithelial dehydration occurs, as you can see here, the epithelium would like to rehydrate, and it takes the water molecule inside. And when that happens, it's not controlled and cell will rupture and that's how cell will dry and it will die. So, Rushard told us about osmometry, that osmolarity checking you can do. Uh, there are now uh, uh, instruments which can help us to study the osmolarity. But interestingly, there is such a high test, test variability in these uh, machines that uh, though they claim that 316, anything more than that is abnormal. But if you look at the entire data, abnormal cases like uh, dry eye cases have such a high variability that a lot of dry eye and normal, they have crossover. So normal patient also can have more than 316 uh, osmolarity and dry eye patient may have less osmolarity. In fact, there were studies which claim that normal, Sjogren syndrome dry eye, non Sjogren's uh, dry eye, mild dry eye, moderate dry eye, all of them can have similar values. So does it help by sp spending so much money to buy an instrument which does not help you in either diagnosis, treatment, nowhere? Well, certainly not. So would, what would you do? Would you rehydrate it by possibly hypotonic solution? Unfortunately, that does not help because even if you put earlier our younger days, we used to have something called hypotears. These uh, medicines would reduce the osmolarity of surface and we wish that it would rehydrate the surface. Unfortunately, that does not happen. Osmolarity returns to its original level within a minute or so. So even if you keep hypotonic saline on the eye, it does not stay there. It's going to just uh, get countered by this thing. So what we can do is, we can possibly have a way around this thing and we can use certain molecules which are osmoprotectants. So these molecules, there are various molecules like smaller molecules like glycerol, they go easily inside the cell, can be there, can come out also easily. So it can rapidly go inside but rapidly come out also. Erythritol goes in rapidly but comes out little slowly and L-carnitin goes with active transport it so little slowly comes out also little slowly. So when you combine all of them together, it can work for a little longer time. I do not have any financial disclosure here, but I would certainly wish that all my lubricants must have an osmoprotective agent, which certainly helps. And these are things which are already uh, published and studied in labs also, so it's not a big deal. Uh, inflammation, Rushar told us about inflammation and we know that there are now um, uh, uh, kits or devices which help us to, uh, so the lubricant part is over, I'm, I'm just touching up that what else I can use along with the lubricant. So if you see a, a test like this thing which tells you that you have little higher MMP9 level, does it mean that it's sacrosanct and it, it gives uh, all the cases it must be done? I won't say anything uh, like that, but does it help? Well, it can certainly help that when you do an MMP9 level, and if you find that test is positive, that means significant inflammatory mediators are there on the surface. These kind of cases, you can certainly use anti-inflammatory molecules like topical steroid initially to start with, like cyclosporin and tacrolimus molecule. Where do they help? Well, mild to moderate cases and not burnt out cases. If you want to give any of these things, you must give in mild to moderate cases and do not wait for advanced dry. They do not uh, help. Tecrolimus clinically is thousand times more potent than cyclosporin. So if somebody can tolerate tecrolimus, I would certainly wish to give them tecrolimus. Tecrolimus is not a new molecule in veterinary science. It's been used uh, in animals for a pretty long time and dogs have very unique tendency. Uh, they have tendency of dry much worse than us. 
and it has been studied in that uh, that it does help tacrolimus there are clinical trials going on about tacrolimus and it mm, does show that tacrolimus has potential uh, cyclosporin tacrolimus where do we use well moderate to severe dry and especially when it's associated with any systemic disorders like rheumatoid arthritis uh, graft versus host disease uh, any other uh, Sjogren syndrome and all these kind of thing certainly would help and it's not a replacement uh, for lubricant. So to summarize, uh, we need to study the etiopathogenesis of dry eye. Hyperosmolarity is an important thing but we would love to have an osmoprotectic agents in uh, our molecules. Inflammation in dry eye uh, needs attention and we can use cyclosporin tacrolimus in selected cases. Thank you very much.